Welcome to Teacher's Corner from Stenhouse Publishers. I'm Nate Butler. Our guests today are Shauna Coppola, author of Writing Redefined, Broadening Our Ideas of What It Means to Compose, and Trevor Bryan, author of The Art of Comprehension, Exploring Visual Texts to Foster Comprehension, Conversation, and Confidence. We recently had the opportunity to put Shauna and Trevor together in person, and instead of us interviewing them, we decided to step back, let the tape run, and capture a discussion between two educators. What resulted was a great conversation about how their individual experiences complement one another, the role of visual arts in communication, and the importance of exploration and inquiry to engage students. I thought it would be interesting to, for us to sort of talk about our current work and how we came to it. So I'm really curious, Trevor, how you came to your current work and your book, The Art of Comprehension. Yeah, so my mission going into education, I think, was to uh, kind of bring the arts more into the forefront of the academic arena. Right? I really, from my experiences growing up, I believe that the arts could play a larger role in the academic lives of children, and so I really wanted to do that. And immediately upon entering education with that as my mission, um, I hit a, a, a gigantic roadblock, which was I, I didn't have a good way of talking about art with people who didn't have a background in art, people who I consider novice viewers, both my students and also my colleagues, and without a good way of talking about art and how it could um, uh, enter into a, a more classroom setting outside of the art room. Uh, it was impossible for me to kind of, you know, cross that bridge of bringing the arts into that academic arena. And so my second mission really became a, looking for a better way of, of talking about art with novice viewers, with mm. kids, with other adults. And that's when I started uh, exploring the use of what are commonly called reading comprehension strategies as a, as a pathway into the artwork. And we realized that we could teach reading comprehension strategies through artwork, right? So I, it's really just comprehension strategies, right? We use them all the time when we look at plays, when we listen to songs, when we look at artwork, illustrations. Um, and so that became kind of my pathway into um, both um, having better conversations about art, more meaningful conversations about art with my students and colleagues, but also bringing art into that, into the academic setting. Yeah, I feel I feel like I'm so fascinated by the fact that in school spaces, art the arts really takes a secondary role. Yeah. And do you feel like that? Um, do Do you see that as well in your work? I yeah, the arts I think often play a secondary role. Um, and what's always kind of interesting is this idea that right it, it, growing up in in my ELA classroom, we would read plays, mm -hmm. but then if a if a drama club was spending three months really right doing uh, the closest read you can of a play to try and figure out how you're going to actually play it and present mm -hmm. it and put it together and work through it and what each scene means and blah 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 that that scene is non-academic work right and that's a that's like that's crazy to me it is crazy um, it's so complex though so, I mean I have yeah. a my younger daughter is hugely into the arts and particularly into community theater right now <laughs> And she actually doesn't go to public school because it doesn't have a lot of um, focus on the arts and the things that she's interested in. And it doesn't go deeply into things um, where, you know, for example, let's say you're blocking out a scene and you're just learning, you're absorbing so much about, you know, just spatially, you're absorbing mm -hmm. so much um, interpersonally. Um, and I just feel like, it is such a shame that that's not seen as really academic. Yeah, and I think I mean, I think one of the problems is that we don't we don't recognize all of the arts as just forms of communication, including reading and writing. Right, yeah. books are works of art. Mm -hmm. um, effective communication is an art form, and that's true whether you're writing something, just uh, giving a presentation, acting. Um, drawing a picture, right? The arts are basically how we learn to communicate. Mm -hmm. I think because reading and writing is so heavily tested, mm -hmm. that that's where that kind of drives all of the tasks and, um, you know, where we, we, where we focus so much attention. But the reality is, uh, especially in, you know, today's age where we have so many mediums that we can play around with that are so um, readily available to students, 
and two kids, right? It's amazing what they can do on a phone. Oh my gosh. <laughs> my daughter's a, a filmmaker, never been asked to make a film in school, but does all of her editing on her phone, right? Gets apps to, for special effects, right? Yeah. Um, we've done green screens in the car, right? It's, it's amazing, right, what she can do. And that's never been part of, an ac of her academic day. Um, but it's all about communication and effective communication and mm -hmm. giving kids an opportunity to learn and explore the best ways um, for them to communicate their ideas. And I think that's where the arts really could play a much more uh, like vital role or prominent role. Yeah, I definitely agree because when I, I think when I was reflecting on um, my, my newest project, um, The Writing Redefined, and how we should broaden our ideas about what we consider to be writing in school spaces and what kinds of writing we privilege in school spaces. Mm -hmm. um, I really thought about the fact that all of the multimodal work, especially in a lot of the visual work that I do, in comics and watercolors and photography, I didn't learn any of that in school spaces. I learned all of that right. on my own. And that's the kind of composition that brings me the most joy and it was interesting because before we were talking, before we started recording, we were talking about Whitney Houston and because I had just finished a book about her and watched the, the documentary. And I almost honestly started crying as we were talking about just the, the effect that, that art and the arts has on people. The, the fact that we don't, and not... I would say it's not, you know, uh, it's a it's systemic problem. Certainly, mm -hmm. it's not something um, that I would blame teachers for. It's really systemic that we don't value the ways that that art um, brings joy to kids and to people. Yeah, really. the arts foster joy and connection, right? That's yeah. why people go to movies and that's why they go to concerts, mm -hmm. right? And they feel connected when you find someone who loves the same band, yeah. right? Or the same music or had the same, um, you had mentioned growing up that Whitney Houston was kind of your soundtrack, yeah, right? Um, and so the, that's what the arts are for, right? The arts help us to um, explore and express our human experience, right? That's kind of what that's kind of why they're around and what they're designed for. Mm -hmm. um, and that's all communication skills, right? Mm -hmm. And exploration skills. And as an, one of the problems in arts education is we put more focus on just basic skills. So for instance, there's a drawing in my book that my, my five-year-old son did, um, which, which uh, right, as an art educator, it, it would be like, to a lot of people, it would be embarrassing right, that my son does not render things accurately, mm. right? And so his, his, he drew a picture of he and his friend John in the ocean, and it's a head with arms coming out of the head and arms coming out of the body, right? And they have big smiles on their face, and he used the sun to show it was a nice day, and they're standing close together, right? And that picture is effectively communicates friendship, and the yeah. joy that friendship brings and the joy of going someplace special, right? So you could kind of think of a day at the beach as a poem, whereas in school sometimes I teach kids kind of like the stock drawing of a, of a pear that looks three-dimensional, right, on gray paper with chalk pastel and, it, and everyone oohs and ahs over it. But the, the pear doesn't convey anything. It just looks real. But it's not a. It's not commute for most people. Looking at a pair doesn't evoke any kind of emotion. But we, if if I put the two up, my son's drawing, which is about friendship and joy and our human experiences, gets dismissed mm -hmm. because of the skill as opposed to the, right. the content is overlooked, and the yeah. pair gets celebrated yes. even though it has no content. It's just. So it's skill. representation. Yeah, yeah. Right. And it's yeah. just kind of like it's stock, right? Yes. I can teach anyone to do it. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think that's one of the kind of the ways that we've traditionally thought about the arts. Right. That doesn't um, kind of go to, I think, our larger mission of what we're kind of talking about, about giving different people lots of different ways to share their authentic voice, explore their personal ideas, and come up with a way that is going to allow them to share those ideas effectively, right? Right. The, right? the arts are how we 
kind of make things shareable. And mm -hmm. for a long time, writing was the most efficient way to share big ideas, right? right? Um, I think that's kind of going away now, right? Because, you know, oh, when I want to sure. learn how to do something, I'm not looking for a text to read. I'm looking for a video, right? Right. And right, so just, just the, the idea of filmmaking as a really important skill right. um, or what we're doing now on the podcast as a, mm -hmm. right, as a skill and collaborating through a podcast mm -hmm. um, as opposed to just, you know, writing letters back and forth. Yes. Um, about our ideas. Um, right. Right. There's a lot of value in that. And I, I, Absolutely. I, I think we need to kind of pay a little bit more attention to that side of idea sharing. Yeah. I'm thinking of a couple of things as you're talking. One is um, I wrote about this in Renew, but there was a moment as a literacy educator where I I had never worked with kindergartners before, and I had this job as a K-6 to literacy specialist in this new school, well, new to me, school. It's actually 80 years old. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, had sat, I had sat down alongside this, this um, he was barely five years old, and it was our first day of school, and we had the kids start making books right away. Um, and I remember sitting down with this child and looking at his work and thinking, I have nothing to say. I don't know what it was just looked like scribbles to me. And what happened was, and I, I, I think it's good to share these moments of like, I wasn't a very good educator, you know, in yeah. this moment. Um, but when I asked him, tell me about, tell me about what you're doing. Tell me about your book. And he was able to speak so beautifully. He had every mark on that page had meaning. And it ended up being something, he was writing a book about Darth Vader. And then once I spoke to him, once he was able to convey that meaning to me, I could see it. And it was just really complex. And this was a child who I think from even before he came, even before we started school, he was sort of flagged as a child that would potentially need special services. But the the complexity of his work and his thinking and his storytelling yeah. was so evident to me once I was able to see once he helped yeah. me see. Yeah. Um, and that I think is when a light went on in my head that my gosh, I really, I really um, don't, I, I haven't even scratched the surface of the kinds of decisions that children make mm -hmm. in their work, whether it's in alphabetic composition or visual composition or other kinds of composition. Right. And so I would say two things in response to that. I would say, A, you were a good educator, <laughs> right, because you were willing to listen. Yeah. And you didn't impose your own personal agenda onto mm -hmm. that child's art making, mm -hmm. right? The other thing I, I think that gets overlooked in the arts is that any artist, right, and I, and I consider like Thomas Edison and Steve mm -hmm. Jobs, anyone who's had a significant contribution the, the, the main skill that they have is they have the ability to explore. Mm -hmm. And they jump in and they're not afraid to put stuff down, get it into a shareable form, look at it, show it to others, get feedback, and figure out the skills along the way that they need in order to more effectively produce whatever it is they're trying to produce. And I, I think we don't, oftentimes, we don't allow students enough exploration, which is the skill that I want kids to learn, right? Stephen exactly. King, when he sat down to write a book, um, he actually threw away Carrie, I think, which was, it was his first major, oh, yeah. it was his You're first major book, now. right? Yeah. So he, he started writing that book as an exploration, yes. right, of this idea. And he had, obviously, he wasn't Stephen King. Right. Um, and he actually threw it away. Mm -hmm. And the only reason why that book exists is because his wife was cleaning his office and started <laughs> reading it. And she was like, I think you have something here. Mm -hmm. And Stephen King was, well, I'm writing about a 16-year-old a girl. I have no idea how to write a 16-year-old girl voice. And she's like, well, I can help you with that. But it was his ability to kind of explore, okay, can I write a 16-year-old, you know, in a 16-year-old girl's voice? Can I, can I do this? Right. right. It wasn't, you know, he didn't, he wasn't, he didn't have pre-canned skills of writing like a 16-year-old girl that he needed to establish before mm -hmm. he started that, right? He just put stuff down and explored. And I think, right, that little boy mm -hmm. was in that exploration stage. And I think that's where great work comes from. Right. It doesn't 
it doesn't come from right. Great work's not going to come from me draw, showing someone how to draw a pair, right? Right, and then having right. that pair, right. and like we've seen that pair for the last four hundred years. Yes, right. We're not really moving the ball. Right. Whereas a kid who is just taking a whole bunch of materials and throwing them together and seeing what happens, mm -hmm. maybe there's going to be something there. Yeah, but that kid's going to not only discover something that's really powerful to viewers, but really powerful within himself yeah. that he's going to he's going to dive deeply into and explore and then who knows where that's going to take us right and he's going to pick up skills along the way that we have we, we would never be able to pre-teach yeah we can't even imagine yeah. the skills that are yeah. going to come about potentially and then if he shares that work right mm -hmm. there's the potential that someone else is going to see an mm -hmm. idea in that and they're going to either start a collaboration or that's going to kind of um you know, branch off into a new direction. And I think that kind of thinking about the arts and, and even writing um, uh, or even conversations about reading sometimes, mm -hmm. right? We don't allow those, ex or we don't emphasize or we don't focus on those explorative processes where we just sort of, we don't know what's going to happen. Right. Um, when I was writing The Art of Comprehension, I had the good fortune of working with teachers where um, Justin Dulcey was one of them, and, and, and Donna Donna, Donna Donner was another. Where I would just go into a room and say, "Can I try this?" Mm -hmm. Right, and we have no idea what's going to happen, and neither one of us knew, right, um, what was going to happen. But it was so exciting, mm -hmm. right, as educators to not know what was going to happen in that classroom, and it, right, that really paved the, the path for me to eventually put a book out there. I think that's where I grew the most as an educator, too, is where I had an administrator who was a true educator, and I had a, a, a cohort of colleagues at this last school where I worked for seven years who were just really willing. We called it taking a healthy risk. Yeah. And we just explored, and I come from a an inquiry background. I was really taught by my mentors, certainly not by my schooling, mm -hmm. to teach using an inquiry approach, but my mentors taught me that, and that that is essentially exploration and sort of you don't know where you're going to end up. Um, you have kind of a, an idea and having worked with children for 20 years now, I have a sense where we might go, but I'm often surprised. And so I think one of the things that is important is um, we've had this sort of vicious cycle of not being given the space, the time and the opportunity to explore even those of us who are educators. You know, we have been in schools that are very, well, depending on where you are, but, you know, a lot of, there's not a lot of room for exploration in most, I think, public schools especially. Um, and so I think there's a big learning curve with books like The Art of Comprehension and Writing Redefined and even Renew around opening up that space and having that humility to sort of you know not know what's going to come of this and some of the best professional learning that I was told that I offered my colleagues um, within the past 10 years was really giving them that time and space and opportunity to explore so rather mm -hmm. than say facilitating a book group um, or offering a series of workshops we just really composed and we compose lots of different ways and using different modes and forms of writing. And um, that is what they told me was the, the, the kind of professional learning that they most needed. Yeah. And it really affected their work with students. Right. Um, so I, I, really Yeah, I think we, a lot of times we want a, like a preconceived outcome, mm -hmm. right? We want it to match the rubric. Yeah. Right. And so we pre-teach so that the, the, the product, right, is what we need for it to score well. Yeah. Um, and I think that gets in the way of, um, you know, a, a lot of creative work. Right. And I think that in, in, in a lot of ways, we, we don't recognize writing as a creative process anymore. Right. We've kind of gotten our, out of that kind of thinking where right. I think in the early writer's workshop, mm -hmm. right, it was a, it was more of a workshop model where it was a little bit more free and kids experimented a little bit more. Yeah. Um, and I think we've, because of the demands on edu on education, on educators, on schools, mm -hmm. we've gotten into a little bit of a place where, um, right, we, we need we need a, a certain out uh, a certain outcome. Right, and I want to speak to that because I feel like whenever I'm working with educators around this concept of redefining writing or perhaps teaching writing through an inquiry approach, like this exploration and 
um, sort of approach, the biggest pushback I get, and I, I always ask for pushback because it helps me clarify my thinking, mm -hmm. um, helps me grow, but um, it's always around, but I, I'm held to the standards, I'm held to this program or this not a program, but actually is just a set of resources, but it's kind of administered as a program. Um, and my answer to that is, well, let's take a look at that. And, you know, often what I find is it actually does not limit us in mm -hmm. the ways we think it does. Absolutely. Um, it's really our own limitations that in our own sort of um, thinking about what we're supposed to be doing or perhaps what we're told we have to do. Um, but if you look at things literally, especially let's say the common so the common core state standards, it's very rare that it's specific, especially in the writing standards, that it's specific to alphabetic text. Right. It's very broad. Yeah. And so when we actually start looking at that, you know, there is space for all of this work. There actually is. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I, I one of the examples that I always give is when I I introduce symbolism to five year olds, mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and um, right, that usually when you look at curriculums, that kind of shows up around middle school yeah. ages, upper elementary, but really in middle schools where I've seen it the most, um, you know, books for like, you know, seventh graders or whatnot. But symbolism, that's how we experience the world, mm -hmm. right? We wake up on a cloudy day and we kind of feel a little bit sad and a five-year-old understands that or, you know, it's so sunny and bright outside, it makes me want to go outside, right? And anything that creates a, a mood in us, as I would say, or, or a feeling is symbolic. It can be easily symbolic. Symbolic. Absolutely. Um, and so when, uh, you know, kids are exploring even the simplest picture books, we have to, I, we have to see those books as symbolic, mm -hmm. right? And the characters are symbolic and the settings are symbolic. And, um, right, but we can do that work a lot earlier Absolutely. and a lot easier if we inter, you know, introduce different types of texts, Absolutely. right? Because we can do that very simply with with pictures yes. um, and look at story structure through pictures, right? And really get, you know, give kids a good handle on that stuff, which is going to not only help their reading comprehensions when they really understand how stories work, mm -hmm. um, but that helps their writing. Exactly. Like it's going to give them better tools. And so I think a lot of the stuff that we're seeing that we have to, we're obliged to teach kids, I think we could do earlier if we do open up different forms of text to them. I totally Cause agree. Because totally, they can focus on those concepts. Right. And I think more often than not, these kids can surprise us and what they're Absolutely. able to, to handle and what comes comes from them, comes from this exploration. It always, you know, quite literally brings me to tears some, you know, when mm -hmm. I'm in the classroom and I see what these kids can do. Well, it's interesting how, you know, you bring up symbolism and, um, and also going back to horror, which is one of my mm -hmm. favorite things to so talk daughter, about. That's what my daughter likes in yeah, her films. Yeah, yeah. So I grew up with Stephen King. I read mm -hmm. him at a very early age. But um, have you seen the movie Get Out? I haven't. Okay, so it's one of my absolute favorite movies um, written by Jordan Peele. And one of the things that when you were talking about um, exploration, it made me think of, uh, I re it recently was on television. I rewatched it with my my 13-year-old, who, by the way, was able to figure out the entire plot from the first 10 minutes, and no one else can. So that just speaks again to what children can, yeah. can do. Um, and I, I read um, that he actually wrote that as an exploration, this mm -hmm. blockbuster, critically acclaimed, horror film right um he actually started writing that just for himself it was something that he wrote to and just kind of work through some of his feelings and his experiences and it eventually went through 200 iterations and became what it is now and um that is chock full of symbolism yeah. and um it really basically is one big symbol and allegory and um so yeah it just re it reminded me of that and how some of the most um, even acclaimed works of art can start through exploration, like you were saying with Carrie. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, I think we we I think a lot of times we have a tendency to focus on good as mm -hmm. opposed to interesting. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite stories. So uh, Peter H. Reynolds. Uh, I was fortunate enough that he did my cover and he illustrated the access lenses in my book. Um, but the story of the dot is when he was really trying to break into illustration on some level, 
he decided that he was going to sketch in his sketchbook every night um, before bed. And he, he, he usually draws with markers. And uh, one night he, um, he, he fell asleep while he was sketching and the marker stuck to the page and it created the dot. Mm. Right, And so if he had gone around showing that picture to people, saying, look at this great drawing I did, right? <laughs> any any two-year-old can sit yeah. there with a marker and stick it to the page and make a dot. So, right, what Peter was able to do was not just say, oh, this, this drawing's not good, but he saw something that was interesting in it, right? And I think that is also like a, a, a barrier mm -hmm. to... Um, you know, evaluating student work, oh, right? We want sure. it to be good, over, so we're going to correct it and formalize it, mm -hmm. um, and we're not looking for interesting. Absolutely. Right? And it was like when you spoke to that child about his Darth Vader, mm -hmm. right? The complexity with what she was talking about and the ideas were super interesting. Now, was it good? Was it well presented? Well, maybe not, like in a sense, mm -hmm. right? But okay, we have something, we now have something that's kind of interesting to work with. And if you find those interesting things, I think as a teacher and as a student, you're going to have a more meaningful, engaging uh, interactions around this work that you're both finding interest in. Right. And let's face it, when we talk about, you know, what is tested, as it, and I'm thinking in particular about writing now, you have this so-called objective idea of what's good mm -hmm. that is as far from interesting as I've ever seen, to be quite honest. Yes, yeah, the when pairs you, that I draw. <laughs> yeah, the right. pairs. The pairs is going to be my new favorite kind of like inside joke. So, um, I'll send you a drawing please. of one. Um, but, you know, it's to me, when I hear um, educators ask me, so I'm supposed to get here, how am I supposed to get there if I'm doing all this exploration and this, you know, incorporating different modes of composition? And, um, and what I often offer or, or question is I say, so what do we ultimately want for kids when we're done with, when they're done being in our space? And that's what my principal initially, that's how we sort of transformed the school that we were at is she asked all of us, what do we ultimately want for kids when they leave here? Um, and when you start there, you you realize that you you can't not do this work because ultimately what we want for kids is, is as far as um, composing in whatever mode we're talking about is mm -hmm. we want them to be to be feel emboldened to share their stories. We want them to feel that their voice matters. We want them to be engaged in mm -hmm. composing, to in communicating and entertaining and uh, arguing and all of these things, and we're not gonna get there, or we're only gonna get there for a very select few, unless we open up our ideas around composition. Yeah, I think it's like to it's like a quantity issue, mm -hmm. right? You need to get massive amounts of quantity to do really good creative work, mm -hmm. right? Writing's creative, um, right? There's kind of like a little difference. Are we are we teaching kids to read or are we teaching kids to love reading, right? Exactly. A very different, exactly. right? If you go into the mindset that we're going to just teach kids to read, that, that sets up a very different classroom than a classroom where we're saying we're going to teach kids to love to read. Mm -hmm. And same is true with write, writers, exactly. right? Are we going to teach kids to write or are we going to teach kids to love writing? And I think when you teach kids to love writing, when you get them to who in a position where they can do a deep dive into this work and think about it on the bus or when they're walking home mm -hmm. or think about it going to sleep or come into school with an idea, right? And, and we're doing all this extra work, right? Um, that increases the, qu the quantity, which is how you increase the quality. Right. And if they're engaged in that work, yeah. then they're going to be more likely to um, humor <laughs> the... The, the schooling gods or whatever we want to call them and actually, you know, engage in some of the work that we're supposed to do. I use yeah. that around yeah. quotes um, in order to continue to have access to schooling and education. We have to show that we know certain things and how to do certain things. But if we want kids to be engaged in that beyond the have tos, then we we can't not do this sort of work and incorporate these different modes and forms of, of composing in the arts into our classrooms. Yeah, and I think um, 
right? All this, right? That all this has this exploratory, mm -hmm. right, um, idea behind it. And I think when you open up and go on explorations, that's where you have the possibility of surprise. Yeah. Right. And surprise is inherently engaging. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. When you're making discoveries. Um, right. And and I think that's. Uh, valuable for the students, but I also think that's really valuable for educators mm -hmm. to go into settings where you're not quite sure what's going to happen, and let's be surprised today, mm -hmm. right? Because that's going to create an exciting environment for everybody. Right. So I think what our job in supporting educators is is to help them navigate those surprises, mm -hmm. and and the more you get, the more you um, start to embrace those and see that it it's more of an opportunity than anything else you know it it opens the door for so many different possibilities when you have surprise rather than be afraid of the surprise right. and supporting educators and that I think is when we can finally move forward in this work yeah and, and I think right you're going to see tons of standards being hit mm -hmm. right if you look for absolutely forum, right so right I, I you know I think sometimes we have a tendency to over teach standards, right? We try and teach standards mm -hmm. as opposed to hitting standards. Mm -hmm. And I think if we kind of have a good handle on the standards that we can see them being hit in different ways. And then if we need to, right, for the parameters that we're operating, <laughs> we can kind of guide kids to a to maybe like a more formal view of, of what they're doing, right? As, as to become more aware of, of how it relates to standardized testing and so forth. But I think um, in all of this work, you're gonna see students hitting a ton of standards. Yeah. Right, and being able to go in and identify exactly what they're doing, um, which I think is really empowering for teachers. For me, the question that I pose to myself and to my colleagues is always, do we want students to create, and that includes writing, in spite of us or because of us? Right. And I, as an educator, I want them to create and feel empowered and want to share their stories because of, of me. I've been able to offer them this, and it's not about me per se, but because of us as educators, I, in, in doing this sort of, this work, we're offering them space and time and opportunity, and they're more likely to engage in it not just in school spaces, but outside of school spaces. Absolutely. And that's really the most important thing for me. Yeah, let them right, uh, explore their curiosity, mm -hmm. right, and foster that curiosity mm -hmm. um, and giving kids an opportunity to do that work. My, my best friend, one of my best friends growing up, became a professional artist. And he's, he's a muralist, and um, he, he's, he's really pretty successful um, as a as an full-time artist. And what was interesting, seeing him when he was eight, and nine and you know going over to his house and working on these projects was his ability to follow his curiosity mm -hmm. was phenomenal if he was interested in, interested in something we just did it right and, we, and he, he i see that thread throughout his whole professional life and although he was um a realist at one point and he could draw the daylights out of anything like um, a pair yeah like a pair <laughs> right you draw awesome pairs um, jaw dropping, and then, um, but what he's got into making his own tools, and he went to abstract, and that's really where his work took off. Um, but it's amazing that that skill that he had to just, oh, let's see what happens, let's try it out. And we walked home from school together, and we would just always talk about these things, and we would run home after school and try them out. Um, and that was the skill that he really had, and I think um, uh, uh, fostering that you know, in any creative process, writing, right, mm -hmm. is so valuable. And it's mm -hmm. really empowering to the learner when they feel like they have that freedom to, you know, take their curiosity and just try it out and see what happens. Mm -hmm. And if it's ultimately beneficial for the children and their work and their, and their um, cognitive development, then it is absolutely beneficial for teachers as well. Yeah. Um, reminds me, who wrote um, Captain Underpants? Oh, is it Dave? Dave, Dave Pilkey? Yeah. Yeah, Dave Pilkey. Do you know that story? Yeah. yeah so oh, that, I have a student who did his own version of Captain Underpants picture book. So do you know the background when he no. created? So Dave Pilkey, when he created Captain Underpants, I think it's a really good example of what we've been talking about. Um, I believe he was ADHD. 
and had behavioral, um, a lot of behavioral problems. So in second grade, his teacher would kick him out of the room and he spent most of his time in the hallway. And uh, um, so to entertain himself in the hallway, he would start drawing comics. And what he, one of the characters he created was Captain Underpants. So he did that <laughs> in second grade. And one day his teacher uh, came out and um, ripped up his comic book and said, you can't spend your whole life drawing comics. And the, oh, really? the little, the, right, the little, <laughs> the, 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 you know, the punchline is, good thing I'm not a good listener. <laughs> right? I but love that. that is a really good example of a kid who is able to um, kind of explore this thing on his own, mm -hmm. right? And really do a deep dive in it. And mm -hmm. then he, right, how many, how many kids are readers today because of that series? Right. Right. And so not focusing on maybe what's good, but mm -hmm. focusing on interesting, yes. right? And it was, and maybe what's interesting to someone else isn't going to meet our interests, but it doesn't mean that there's not value in it. Right. <laughs> our guests today were Shauna Coppola, author of Writing Redefined, Broadening Our Ideas of What It Means to Compose, and Trevor Bryan, author of The Art of Comprehension, Exploring Visual Text to Foster Comprehension, Conversation, and Confidence. Both books can be found at stenhouse.com, and both authors have their own websites for more information. Trevor's is theartofcomprehension.com, and you can reach Shauna at shaunacopla.com. That wraps up another edition of Teacher's Corner. Check out our website at stenhouse.com, where you can find the podcast archives, book previews, study guides, and more. If you haven't done so already, we'd appreciate it if you can take one minute to give us a review at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or whatever podcast player you use. It helps out a lot. And if you've done that already, thank you. Please consider sharing this show with a friend or colleague who you think could get something from it. And as always, thank you for listening. And if you have any questions or comments, we'd love to hear from you. Send your thoughts to us at marketing at stenhouse.com. Until next time, I'm Nate Butler, reminding you to not only listen to Teacher's Corner, but to put what you heard into practice.